Well, hello, friends. Russ Barkley back again for another whack at this ADHD pinata, if you want to call it that. Uh, obviously, dressed in my brawny paper towel commercial flannel shirt for you today. So, a little cold here in Richmond. Today, I want to talk about a topic that I'm occasionally asked about, particularly within the mental health professions, but also by some lay people. And that has to do with why is there a higher risk? for antisocial activities, conduct problems, and substance use disorders in people with ADHD, particularly children as they are growing up. So I want to examine that because, first of all, there is a higher risk. We know from longitudinal studies that as little as 25% of ADHD kids, all the way up to 45% or more by adolescents, have developed conduct disorder, which is a pattern of antisocial activities and violating the rights of others from lying, stealing, running away, fighting, breaking and entering, uh, drug use, uh, and other problems that go along with conduct disorder. So the, the risk is not trivial, even though the majority of people with ADHD don't go on to develop antisocial behavior, a significant subset of them do. And of those who do, they pose the greatest risk for developing substance use disorders. Now, don't get me wrong, ADHD alone is a risk factor predisposing toward higher rates of use of alcohol, nicotine, as well as caffeine, and even marijuana. I've talked about that before in other videos. But when ADHD links up with conduct disorder or other antisocial activities, the risk is even higher for developing a substance use disorder uh, and also more severe substance use disorders. Now we're getting into the use of prescription opioids illegally or use of meth uh, or heroin or other harder drugs as we think of them, street drugs. So. It's when ADHD links up with antisocial behavior that we really start to see a connection with substance use disorders. So uh, let's take a, a, a deep dive here for, for just a moment into why does this risk exist? Obviously, not everybody with ADHD goes on to have these problems. So why do some of them do and some of them don't? Well, first of all, let's take a look at factor number one here, the risk of ADHD severity is linked to antisocial behavior. So the more severe ADHD is, the greater the likelihood that the child by adolescence has begun drifting into some kind of conduct problems or antisocial behavior. Now, uh, why is that? It's because, we talked about it earlier, ADHD is associated with executive functioning deficits, among those, of course, being disinhibition, uh, a very poor sense of time, and a very limited window on time leading to a high time preference. Now, what does that mean? It means that people with ADHD aren't thinking as much about the future consequences of their actions. So it's no surprise that they would opt to do things that bring them benefits now and not worry so much about the consequences later. And you could see where they might choose to engage from time to time in some antisocial activities, particularly, say, lying or stealing as a child. The second thing we know is that the more severe the ADHD is, the greater its adverse impact on intelligence. And so more severe cases may have somewhat more limited intellectual ability than less severe cases. So that's another risk factor we know. Because one thing we know about people who engage in criminal activity is that they tend to have less intellectual scores than do the typical population on average. Now, both of those factors, more severe ADHD, having a more adverse effect on intelligence could lead to poorer academic performance in school. And that's why that is also a risk factor for antisocial activities, which then go on to lead to risk for substance use disorders. All of those factors, as you can see here, are going to result in the individual getting less education overall, maybe even dropping out of school. And again, if there's one thing we know, it's that the less education you get, the more likely individuals are to engage in 
antisocial activities, and even drug use. So now you can see at least some of the factors that are stacking up over the life of a child and teen with ADHD that are further predisposing them down that pathway that you see here, this big arrow, toward antisocial activities and toward exposure to substances, particularly illegal substances. So it's no wonder then that about 25% or more of people with ADHD by adulthood have developed a substance use disorder. And it's those with greater antisocial activities and conduct problems that carry the highest risk for those drug use disorders. But wait, we're, we're not done, there's more. We also know that the less education you get and the more trouble you're having in school, the greater the likelihood that you're going to be rejected by the more typical pro-social peer group and you're going to start to affiliate with more deviant and more antisocial peers. Other people who are struggling in school are going to affiliate with you because like you, they may not have as many friends or as many pro-social friends as typical individuals do. And again, one of the biggest factors that predicts antisocial activity in children growing up is affiliation with deviant antisocial peers. So there's that peer pressure effect, that peer modeling effect, the peer use of, of drugs, uh, and all of that feeds back to affect the individual who is now affiliating with that peer group. Let's also understand that about five to 10% of kids and young adults with ADHD have a personality disorder that many people refer to as psychopathy or psychopathic personality, but what we also know in psychology as a pattern of callousness, lack of emotionality, lack of conscientiousness, disregard for others, lack of empathy, all of which has re been referred to as callous unemotional. So individuals with that pattern of personality, if it links up with ADHD, are much, much more likely to begin to engage in antisocial activities and then later drug use. Now, on top of those two factors, we know that kids with ADHD have parents with ADHD. About 25 to 35 percent of their parents are likely to do so. And if the parent has ADHD, there's also a good likelihood that the parents are having difficulties with substance use and maybe abuse, what we call SUDS here. And a subset of those parents are gonna have that antisocial personality pattern, that callous unemotional pattern of traits as well. So if you have parents with ADHD, particularly if they're engaged themselves in antisocial activities and drug use, well, that's going to affect any ADHD child growing up in that family through modeling, through pressure to behave in similar ways, and the child now is going to be at risk for antisocial behavior and drug use as well. And all of those factors, on top of reduced parental monitoring of teens and an increased risk of maltreatment as a child in people with ADHD whose parents may have ADHD, well, we know that lack of parental monitoring also was a predictor of drifting toward deviant peer groups, engaging in antisocial behavior that goes undetected because the parents aren't tracking, checking on the teen to see where they're going, who they're hanging out with, what they're doing. So all of that begins to conspire, as you can see here, to create a lot of not only individual risk factors that I've listed on this slide, but that they begin to interact with each other in ways that further predispose down this pathway toward greater antisocial activities, even criminal behavior. And when that develops, the propensity of ADHD individuals toward greater use of substances now becomes even worse with more substances, more severe substance use, and so on, and those begin to interact with each other. One of my studies showed that early antisocial activity leads to a greater risk later for drug use, but we also showed that early drug use predisposed toward later antisocial activity, controlling for the other factor at our time one entry into the study. So these things like a whirlwind, like a cyclone, are bi-directional. 
As one develops, it influences the other, which feeds back to influence the first one. And it doesn't matter which of the two you start with, drug use or antisocial behavior, they're going to exacerbate each other over time. So it's no wonder then that adults with ADHD do have a higher risk, as do teenagers with ADHD, of contact with the criminal justice system, which also helps to explain why 60 to 80 percent of juvenile offenders referred to the juvenile justice system have ADHD as a comorbid disorder. And that figure, when we get into the adult prison population, is about 25 percent of adult prisoners have ADHD, along with lots of other comorbidities, background risk factors that we talked about here uh, as well. So a lot going on here to help us think through this pathway from ADHD to antisocial activity to substance use. It's complicated, yes, but it's not impossible for us to understand how all that plays out. And I think this slide does a very good job of conveying that complexity. So now we know why a minimum of 25% and upwards of 45% or more of ADHD kids may wind up with conduct problems, then antisocial activity, then affiliation with deviant peers, and then drug use disorders, on top of which comes the increased risk for contact with the criminal or juvenile justice system. So there's also an increased risk for substance use here I need to mention that comes through genetics. The genes that are risk genes for ADHD are also risk genes for other disorders, particularly for some substance use disorders like nicotine use disorder, alcoholism, and so on. So if you have ADHD and you have those genes, it's not only contributing to your ADHD, it may be contributing to risk for substance use disorders as well. And let's not forget that certain disorders, such as bipolar disorder, further increase the risk of substance use in people with ADHD. So I hope you understand just how complicated things are, but we can, by looking at this slide, understand that there are things that can be done about this. So all of the factors that we've talked about here are malleable, they're changeable. We can treat ADHD early and perhaps reduce the risk or even eliminate the risk for these later problems with school, with affiliating with deviant peers, with antisocial activity, with later drug use. Those are all downstream effects from early and more severe ADHD. Treat the ADHD, there's a good possibility you will greatly lessen the risk of those other problems. And that has been demonstrated in population-wide studies. We can also get into the schools and work with ADHD children who are having academic achievement problems through special education, through Section 504, and other services that can be provided to these children to help mitigate the impact of ADHD on low academic performance and attainment. We can also treat the parents' ADHD and drug use disorders. If it's assessed and documented to be there, that's a malleable factor as well. And in doing so, we can work with the parents on improving their supervision of ADHD children that have started to drift down the pathway toward conduct problems and antisocial activity. Parents can act then, if they're monitoring their children, to interrupt the affiliation with deviant peers, try to promote their child's affiliation with more positive pro-social peers, perhaps through organized clubs, perhaps through sporting activities, church activities. Any place where we can get this child exposed to better peers is going to be helpful. And we also know that oppositional disorder, which is also related to risk for conduct disorder, can also be managed through various parent training and family training programs such as my programs for defiant children and defiant teens. And of course, of course, the other comorbidities that I've mentioned that predispose to drug use are themselves treatable. But at the end of the day, the most important factor is the degree of impulsivity, the degree of behavioral disinhibition, the degree of executive deficits, and especially emotional dysregulation that is the first step down this pathway toward antisocial activity and drug use. So again, that says treating ADHD early, particularly its behavioral inhibition problems, would go a long way toward mitigating or eliminating 
these risk factors that lead to those downstream effects. So uh, I hope you found this presentation useful. Uh, I know that my colleagues, when I speak about this connection, uh, also find it very illuminating to think about how ADHD moves through a pathway that increases risk for those other disorders. So thanks for joining me today. I hope you found this informative. Uh, and again, as always, think about subscribing to the channel if you're not a subscriber, and please recommend us to others if you like what you're hearing here today. Thanks everybody and be well.